Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our conversation uh, on a very uh, timely and a very complicated matter. Uh, welcome here. Welcome on Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, we're saying hello to everyone watching us. Uh, my name is Sergei Lagodinsky. I'm a member of European Parliament uh, from Germany, speaking to you from Berlin. And uh, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Alice Kunke. Hello, Alice. Uh, Hello. Hi, hi. <laughs> hi. I don't even know whether you are speaking to us from Stra uh, from uh, Brussels or from Stockholm. Um, I'm in Brussels. I'm ah, in you're Brussels. in Brussels. Okay. Well, great. And we have Marvin. I hope you can hear us. I can uh, hear Marvin you. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, Marvin, you thank you so much. I know that you're totally in a, in a very difficult, stressful time. I can imagine, and uh, we're even more grateful. Uh, for you joining uh, us, Marvin Rees, uh, Bristol, uh, uh, Mayor of Bristol. I will introduce both of you uh, uh, in a second. But before that, I would like to make a couple of technical uh, notes. It's important since this is a new format for many people uh, joining us. Um, before we start, uh, a few details. First of all, this is a live stream. The live stream is going to be recorded, and this live stream will be available after after the uh, the, the live uh, uh, performance. Uh, you can, everyone who is watching us, can post their questions uh, on Facebook or on Twitter, Periscope. Those questions will be then asked by us. And beware, when we ask your question, we will blend in your name and the picture of your profile in the screen so uh, that you're not surprised by that. Um, so uh, this is uh, this is about it uh, regarding the the technical notes. And uh, now let me introduce uh, both of you a little bit uh, uh, longer. Elis uh, uh, Bakunka is a member of the European Parliament, elected just recently together uh, uh, in uh, uh, May uh, last year. Prior to that, she served as a Swedish Minister of Culture and Democracy from 2014 to 2019, so five years. Uh, um, in charge of culture and democracy in her country, uh, and in this country, in this uh, function, you were also responsible uh, for issues anti-discrimination, human rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Marvin, Marvin Rees is a, uh, uh, is a is a mayor of Bristol, elected in 2016, uh, has been very active on uh, uh, issues of racial uh, uh, equality, social justice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera and uh, was a founder of the so-called Bristol Leadership Program. And leadership is a, is a term that is so important today. Uh, we should maybe talk about this a little bit later. Uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, both of you. And I would like to start with a rather personal question. I mean, these two weeks that we have experienced um, were very moving for anyone, uh, anyone who is following the situation, uh, but of course, for some of us with our personal stories, you know, it triggers a lot, uh, a lot politically and personally. And I would like to ask, start with Alice and ask her, uh, what was your personal experience during the past weeks? What was going on in your mind and in your soul? Well, <laughs> that's a big question uh, in, in my soul. Well, um, being being a mother uh, and having uh, three daughters uh, uh, in beautiful colors, uh, of course, uh, I think the hardest part has been explaining to them why black people are being killed by their police and how come uh, this is one of the most common ways of uh, death in the in the U.S. during the last years, and I. The, this has been very hard because as a politician, you have these nice answers and figures and I can talk from a Swedish perspective and an EU perspective. But at the same time, when it comes to the color of my skin and their skin and their grandfather's skin and our history, it is really quite hard. As my eight year old girl, uh, youngest girl, she, she said to me, will they kill me too? And And, and that sounds almost like a uh, I mean, she, but she said that. She asked me, will they kill me too because I am black? That's and, incredible. And that was very hard answering. Alice, it, it is hard. It's very hard time. And yet you did something that I, I think was extremely courageous. You read the comments that you have been getting during the past weeks 
on uh, the Instagram and you presented them to your viewers uh, live. And those were really harsh, r racist and, and, and offending statements. Why did you decide to do this? Well, you know, I have been, and I, I, I feel embarrassed to, to saying this, but I have been normalizing being a victim of racism because this has been part of my life. I mean, the first time I was threatened to being killed because of my, the color of my skin, I was all, only 11, 10, 11 years old. Then it was the neo-Nazis in Sweden that were upset because my father bought a company. And they called and said that if you don't leave the country in two weeks, we will kill you and your uh, sister, uh, uh, siblings, and your mother and father. That was the first time. And after that, being a public figure in Sweden, I have gotten used to all these hatreds. I mean, uh, the, the, I mean, <laughs> I have, I mean, this is normal life. I don't know anything else. But mm. the voices or, or the tone in the messages I got when we raised this on social media, what's happening in the US, and what, and we put the focus on the racism and the police brutality in Sweden. I, my, my friends and my colleagues who are white. Uh, in the parliament they said this is awful we need to talk about this people don't know about this and then i was like don't they know don't everybody know is this isn't this a reality for everyone and no it wasn't i have got so ma much and many reactions people are being shocked on what i have heard not only during the last mm -hmm. weeks but during my whole life yeah. Well, thanks for sharing it with us. This is really a, an important message to everyone. Marvin, uh, let me turn to you. Um, you're also someone who has uh, personal connections uh, with the United States. Uh, we met, uh, in fact, in the United States, and I think you also have family or friends yeah. uh, there. And yet now you were watching what was going on there. Was this a personal surprise to you or was it a confirmation how did you how did you feel about that oh well sadly it's not a surprise um and that is the sad thing about it when we talk about normalization mm. it's it's one of the tragic realities that sometimes you stop and reflect and realize that you know this this is this is yeah the fact it's not a surprise is, is the real tragedy um emotionally uh, you know, I haven't been able to watch it. I've seen clips. I think some people have watched the whole footage, but I can't. I haven't been able to watch uh, When They See Us uh, before that, the, the Netflix documentary about the four young uh, mm. black men that were, you know, mm. uh, unjustly uh, locked up. Um, I, so I, I, I do think that over recent years, it has actually been really building up, to, uh, really building up for me. I think, I think for me, that again, the real deep tragedy is not simply the murder, um, but actually it's the confirmation of black lives not mattering by the political legal system. You know, the, the fact that people aren't even arrested or they're let off or they, they're found not guilty when they blatantly shot people. Or even in this, uh, with, uh, uh, in this most recently, three officers not arrested for days and they were there. I mean, I just find that remarkable. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's the system, it's the systemic confirmation that you, that lives don't matter, that um, uh, really hits home for me. But if I can share with you, Sergey, because I, so I married a white American, right? And and again, how have I acclimatized to it? You begin to triangulate these things without even thinking about it. So just after I was elected, um, I was in New York and I was looking for our, our consulate and I couldn't find a building. I was in my suit and a tie and I looked across the road. I couldn't find it anywhere uh, in amongst the skyscrapers. I, I saw a police, I saw a police car rear end parked up against the pavement. And I thought, oh, I'll go and ask the police officer. Right. So I've got no question. I'm going to go and ask him. But I made a conscious decision not to walk on the pavement and approach the car from behind. I made a conscious decision to walk in the road and approach the car from the front. It's a small thing, right? You may be saying I'm paranoid, but I made that calculation. And I was, as I was walking to the car, I was saying, just let me speak. Then they'll know I'm British, I'm not African-American, and they won't see me as a threat. Now, I felt all sorts of things inside my head when I reflected on what happened there, right? Incredible. Uh, one is, I am calculate. I am assuming that they're going to see me as a threat, despite my suit and all that. Mm -hmm. I'm also looking for a way out not to be a threat 
to that officer so I can just interact normally. And I spoke and he was friendly. Oh, British guy, yeah, that, that, mm-hmm. you know. But, but I'm also confirming in that notice that I know an African-American, I want believe an African-American wouldn't have had that experience. And my wife is a white American and I, you know, I talked to her about it and I said, is that what it means to be white? That you don't even, you don't <laughs> even do that triangulation, right? You don't even think, hey, I'm going to be a threat. Yes, yeah. yes. What, a, what an amazing place to be. So to me, that's yeah. like when I used to go on expedition, you carry a rucksack and you get used to it. And then one day you don't yeah. carry the rucksack and you're flying around. You don't even need, you don't even realize mm-hmm. you're making these calculations. You just do it. This, is, this is one of the best uh, description of what yeah. it means to feel something that m- the majority or, or the m- mainstream or what the dominating, the dominant majority doesn't feel. We will never be able to experience this because we are not in, your, in, that, in those shoes. Um, but I think, uh, Sergei, you can sometimes. So interestingly, my mum is a white woman. My mum did have to start making calculations about what she did with me and my sister as brown children. Right. My right. wife is a, a white American. She is making calculations about our brown children, uh, when she feels safe, how she feels about the United States. So most people won't, but there are, there are times when people actually do uh, walk through that door of enlightenment and start start making those calculations themselves too, you know, also. Mm. Um, if I may, let me, let me step one more, make another step a little bit out of the only, because you are, you know, you, you, your person is, of course, your background, but you're also a passionate leader and a politician and a mayor of an important city in the, uh, in, in, in the, uh, in, in the UK. Um, and your experiences now in the past days were also quite unique. We saw that um, the uh, civil protest uh, took also visible turns. Um, we saw the monument of a, uh, a famous um, slave trader, uh, um, Edward Colston, taken down by your citizens, citizens of your city. And here you are. You are responsible for a city. Uh, there is something going on which, in under normal circumstances, you probably wouldn't condone. Mm. Um, but at the same time, there is this other part of you. How how, well, how does it? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm asking this. This is like no, a, it's <laughs> no, it's not because it's exotic. It's just, it's just, it must be a, a huge, huge tension within you. What, what, how, what did you feel? So and how did you make you're, decisions? You're right. I cannot condone criminal damage. I'm elected mayor of the city. Um, and I have to be clear about that. And I also, well, I was also clear before the big uh, Black Lives Matter rally that had real concerns about um, mass gatherings with the COVID pandemic that disproportionately kills black and brown people and also the lockdown that results disproportionately takes money out of the pockets of black and brown um, households. So, you know... I've been clear about that. At the same time, as I've shared many times, I can't pretend that the existence of that statue to a slaver in the middle of Bristol was anything other than a personal affront to me. Uh, and I don't mourn its, I don't mourn its loss to that place uh, within Bristol. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I, you know, I have to look at it as a politician with my responsibility to social order, uh, but I'm a black politician. Um, and I am a black man, and, and this this Edward Colston may have owned one of my ancestors. Uh, it was the truth mm. of it because he was involved in a triangular trade. Um, wow. So I don't, I you know, our, my challenge now is to say how do we hold the city together, and how do we make sure that this moment is a moment for uh, reflection and building of human relationships and understanding how we begin to live with difference. Um, there were many people who who were elate, elated about it. Some are very concerned. They're indifferent about the statue. They realize it wasn't ideal, but they're concerned about the way it was done. Um, and there were others who were really angered because they feel that Edward Colston is an integral part of Bristol's history. And, and by it being torn down by a group of protesters, they're losing their own purchase mm-hmm. within the city and something of their own identity. Um, yes. You know, my job is to hold that together. Yeah, uh, it's incredible, an incredible tough, tough job to do. Um, uh, but that brings us actually to, um, it brings us back home. 
You know, we we've been watching all those those videos of the United States and of the uh, peaceful and not very peaceful demonstrations there uh, about the civil uh, uh, protests there, and we did not very often did not have enough time. You see that you know this this is how our media coverage looked like for the past weeks. Um, but we did not have time uh, very often, except for certain, uh, you know, monuments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to look at ourselves. Uh, what is happening in Europe? What is our baggage uh, that we are carrying on our bags, and we need to sort things uh, out? Uh, Alice, was it enough for you, from our European perspective, from the Swedish perspective? Um, was there enough mirrors in that media room uh, that we were uh, in for the past two weeks to look into the mirror and to say, sorry, it's not just about the United States. What about us? Well, no, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't enough mirrors. And it was in the Swedish case, it was even uh, as uh, bad as some politicians from parties that uh, we, I mean, even one profile politician that uh, is uh, uh, collaborating with our right-wing party, I mean, the right-wing party that really feeds the hatred and the racism and, the, and I mean, all this that we are suffering from, she, re she put out on her Instagram, Black Lives Matter. And then my my fuel went off. I don't know what it's called in English, but my my you know this thing in the engine when the the steam the off, steam the steam went off because so then uh, I uh, I wrote this article and published in one of our biggest newspaper about what are you saying? Are you saying that Black Lives Matter and at the same time collaborating with the racist party in Sweden that really put all this hatred at us and so on and so forth? So I mean there has been so. A easy way out for many politicians in Sweden, in, in many other countries in the EU, saying, oh, this is so sad and how awful it is what happened and uh, with the police violence and so on and so forth. But really looking into to the colonialists, into the, the racist structures mm -hmm. in our countries, I mean, this is something we need to force them to do. And I, and I'm, I hope that we are, there are many of us that will continue in doing this, because this is a problem here too. Mm, interesting. Uh, uh, Marvin, um, I mean, you are a ma manager of uh, one part of Europe, of your, of your city. Um, do you see differences? I mean, can we say one to one? And like, wh what is, what is the, the mirror that we are looking in, into if we are honest with ourselves? And what is different than in the United States? I think one of the differences between the US and the UK is the police have guns. <laughs> uh, to be perfectly honest, you know, we've had deaths in custody here. Um, Kingsley Burrell, Sean Rigg. Um, I used to work on a program looking at racial inequalities in mental health, uh, you know, off the back of uh, uh, David Rocky Bennett, who was in a mental health institution and restrained by a number of mental health nurses. And when they got up, he was dead. Um, that led to, you know, and this, this constantly happens. Um, we, we have inequalities in our education system that come out based on race and ethnicity. I mean, these things just call it, it's just what the numbers tell us. It's not about feeling guilty, not about, uh, you know, feeling sad or anything. It's just that cold, hard look at the numbers. Um, inequalities in economic standing, uh, social mobility, health outcomes. Uh, in, in, in the whole bag. Race, see, I, I'm always at pains to, to you know, racism isn't just about individual acts. Mm -hmm. um, every now and again, someone is killed far too often, but every day, people with brown skin in the UK are born with a lower life expectancy, right? It's because of housing, educational trajectories, mental health, um, uh, access to quality, uh, nutrition, you know, Someone calls it um, food deserts. I heard someone say mm -hmm. that it's not food deserts. Deserts are a natural phenomenon. This is food apartheid. People not mm -hmm. getting access to good quality, fresh food, diversity that give you that basis for life, right? Health for life. So, you know, you add up the, the life years lost through murders. If you compare it to the life years lost by people who were just born with a lower life expectancy or the life years lost because people end up in a criminal justice system, you know, through the combination of, you know, substandard, um, you know, early years, adverse childhood experiences, poor diet, poor mental health, 
you begin to see actually the structural churn out of inequality mm. probably far and away exceeds uh, the acts of individual uh, violence uh, that we're mm -hmm. seeing. Mm -hmm. Not that I condone, <laughs> you, know, way, you know, clearly condone the acts of individual violence, but it's the invisible structural uh, theft of life that I think is uh, amongst the most pernicious um, evils. It's like C.S. Lewis said, right? Greatest weapon the devil ever had was to convince people he never existed. Um, mm. And I think that's the most dangerous form of racism. Mm. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Can yeah. I add something? Yeah, sure. I mean, and, th and that's also what you said now is also the reason why it's so important that all this engagement, all these feelings from, 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 from white people also, and from people with power, that it's really translated into, uh, I mean, fighting poor, poor uh, fighting inequalities, and making sure that people have uh, somewhere to live, uh, changing the education system, and so on and so forth. I mean, that's the that's the answer to when people now ask me every day on my social media, oh, what can you do? What can I do? I mean, you can fight for this, fight for we must. I mean, we must end poverty. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's one uh -huh. of the biggest challenges we have. And can I say, Alice, off the back of yeah. that, so again, that's an, another important area that I'm trying to navigate all the time. So there is such a thing called white privilege, but my mum, who's white, did not lead the life of privilege. My grandfather came from a Welsh mining town called Merthyr Tydfil. His, his father was a five-foot Welsh miner who swore his children would never go down the mines, dirt poor. They were white people but didn't live in white privilege, but there is such a thing called uh, white privilege. And I think one of the one of the pathways to success, success of anti-racism and then getting rid of racism is not to allow those people who've been left behind by the global economy to be divided and ruled. So I'm very yeah. at pains to point out the connection between fighting racism and, and fighting all forms of poverty and oppression. Yes, Actually, the, yes. the interdependence <laughs> between social immobility that impacts all people born into poverty and racism because that wider challenge of, that, that of social immobility means that if you're born poor and black you don't get on in life if you're born poor and white no. and there was a fantastic quote i read some years ago of a of a um a white union organizer um in the united states just after the civil war and he said when they set black americans free they didn't make them free they just made them slaves with all the white working slaves mm. you know <laughs> i know there's some complexity to yeah. that uh, but it, but we in the anti-racism efforts must also be speaking to the concerns of the dispossessed uh, white people on the planet too. Otherwise they will be groomed by far right extremists who say, look, you're mm. being left behind but, by the politically correct crate. They, they, all they talk is about race, they're not interested in you. But uh, Marvin, Marvin, Alice, I, I, but, but don't, you, don't you think, I mean, we have a situation in, uh, in Germany where um, it is all very often uh, said that the situation, for example, of anti-migrant uh, protests and, and populism is a result of social inequality and that the poor, you know, it's, make, make people a little bit more wealthy, a little bit more socially uh, um, uh, secured, and this problem will go away. To be honest, from my perspective and from my experience, well, I'm not... Uh, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not a member of, a, well, I am a, as a Jew, I'm yeah. of course a member of my dorm, but I'm not as marked, you know, as, as seen uh, as such. But I, um, I don't think that, I mean, poor people are just as privileged uh, because they're white and because they can exercise. This is their chance. This is their chance to exercise power. Yeah. Uh, to find someone who is even is worse, <laughs> even worse off, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and that's why I ask myself whether this is just a question of uh, welfare and social uh, issues. No, yeah. it's not just a question about social and welfare issues. It's not just, but that to change uh, to to end poverty is one tool to uh, create the. Uh, environments circumstances where people have uh, food <laughs> where people can uh, think that their children will have a, a a future in some way a good future maybe so it's not the only way to work but it's one tool and that's also why you need to think uh, have an intersectional perspective because mm -hmm. i think that if not 
we can't fight for black lives to matter if we don't also fight for LGBTI persons' lives to matter and for the Roma people's lives to matter and the poor people's lives and so on and so forth. I mean, if we don't, I'm afraid that if we don't have a very broad intersectional perspective on fighting this to make sure that what happened, the murder of George Floyd doesn't repeat itself over and over again. If we, I mean, we risk that if we narrow this down to only be about black, because then we can ask who black who? Am I black enough or who? I mean, I mean, there are so many degrees of this. I think the intersectional perspective and the broad perspective and, and to handle this complexity and so many, I mean, balls in the air at the same time. Yeah. It's the only way to identify what is needed to be done. And it's not only one thing, it's several things that need to be changed. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I agree with that. And uh, actually, we just uh, started, launched a campaign with, the, uh, uh, among others, also with the Union of Jewish Students, uh, where, where we say, uh, uh, Roma rights are Jewish rights and Jewish rights are Roma rights. And by the way, I think that Sinti and Roma population in Europe are precisely those who are also targeted, uh, um, are, are, are the, the groups targeted by racism here, homegrown racism. Yeah. And we don't talk about that. No. Yeah? We are now looking at, uh, at the United States and Washington and nobody speaks about the situation in Bulgaria, in Romania. and very often in our home countries regarding Sinti and Roma. Um, and I do think, uh, and uh, Marvin and myself, we spoke very often about this and Alice uh, for a year, we've been speaking about this as well. I do think that without, um, and I think we, we have to be careful here. Uh, I do not have, as a white person, I do not have a moral right now to, to say, I know how it feels to be uh, uh, of African American background, but this is a different matter to say. I feel in solidarity as a as a representative of a minority as well, because this is how we how ca how we can combat those issues with alliances of minorities and majorities. So on that, I completely agree uh, uh, with you, Alice. Uh, uh, Marvin, you are, you as a mayor of Bristol. Do you have any experience on, uh, I mean, of course you do, but, but what, kind, what kind of experience did you make? I mean, since 2016, you are in charge of your city. And of course you look at those problems. Um, what are the tools that you think are the most effective? Of course, I mean, you're a labor member. Yeah. Uh, this is yet another identity of yours. But, um, but beyond social, uh, issues and improving the social situation. What are the tools you would recommend to all of us in other countries in order to combat hatred and racism? Well, that's a big one. Because I think actually, having said we need to tackle poverty in general, I, I think, like I said, it's one of the tools, but it's a critical tool. So I think desperate people are vulnerable to, uh, become vulnerable or desperate to grooming by, by bad politics. Um, we in, in 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 terms of Bristol, we've done we've operated on a number of levels. Uh, we're a very wealthy city, well known for being wealthy, and yet we have, you know, about twenty five percent of our kids in income deprived households. We have twenty percent of our children um, in uh, in food insecurity. It's remarkable numbers. The level of inequality uh, we have in Bristol. And I come in uh, committed to tackling that. We've made a priority of affordable homes. Um, uh, you know, work experience for children that weren't getting access to professions, uh, tackling period poverty. We've had a very successful campaign um, in the city to make sure that no girls or women go without sanitary products. Um, you know, we've made a real drive on inclusive economic development. And, and I, if I can say, actually, now I reflect, one of the things that that's done is because I've been very ambitious of, uh, with the economy um, and because I have worked with all people, when I have then talked about race, um, I've had a listening ear um, uh, because, because I, I have a track record of delivering for everyone. I think the danger of being a black politician is whenever you talk about race, people hear, they don't hear you talk about race, they hear you saying, essentially, you know, don't care about white people. And it's just the way yeah. Yeah. Some, of, some people have then tried to, to interpret it. I will say too, Sergei, that I have drawn on my own mix in this quite, quite overtly. You know, I have shared, you know, I think I just shared, you know, my mum's white, but she didn't leave a life of privilege. 
I want to talk about race and racism in all its fullness, but recognize that my white grandfather um, was essentially oppressed, you know, working class, uh, never got to live out his ambition because he was born poor, uh, mm -hmm. you know, should have gone to university, but just wasn't rich enough in his era to go to university. So he just ended up working in a bus company. And I think he was a frustrated man until he died, had all this intelligence and never got out, never got, never got going for him. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I I, I think meeting those basic needs for, for everyone has been absolutely essential. And, and I don't know if it's right to say it like this, but I sense that, you know, there's a piece of me that feels that I've earned the right to speak about race. Now, you have a right to speak about it because it is because racism is real. So you don't need mm -hmm. to earn the right to speak about it. But as an element of me that thinks I have earned the right because of what we've done, you know, across the wider city. Um, but there are no simple answers. I mean, to me, to me, fundamentally, racism isn't about whether I'm nice to you or I mean to you, whether I call you names. It's about whether you can impact on my housing, uh, my life expectancy, my job prospects, my pension. Uh, and so my approach to, to tackling racism has really been on to focus in on the economics. We can get to the love stuff. Right. But if you put the love stuff in place, uh, but my children are still born destined to die before yours, we have an issue. Right? Um, mm -hmm. So I want to get to those underlying drivers and, and, and build the relationships from there on. Interesting. Alice, uh, is, yeah, please. Yes, you wanted to react. I was, uh, yes, because I also think that, uh, I mean, racism is forbidden. Uh, and we have laws that uh, forbids racism. And still racism is everywhere in all over the world, in all societies. Uh, we have racism and we have had racist systems uh, and now it is forbidden. So my, one thing I really have uh, thought a lot about is why do we accept something that is forbidden to be so common? How come we doesn't make sure that laws and uh, legislations that we have are useful? And why don't we make sure that the police who has the monopoly on, on violence in our societies uh, I mean, are really filled with with uh, with all the the factors that build trust. I mean, this is something that we all can work at, especially we as politicians, to make sure. And I think this is really a. I feel ashamed being a politician and not being able to fill the laws we have with more with more uh, more strength. This is such mm. a under. Uh, I mean, we are underperforming in a big way, in a major way. But you both are talking about a kind of a, a way of investing into into uh, empowering uh, uh, minorities, uh, you know, by social etc. Resources. What about what about protecting minorities? Um, you know, because it is not the I, my my take on what happened uh, in in Minnesota was not about just the social inequality. It's about the right to step on someone's neck, you know, the right to show who is the 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 owner of the country. This is how I interpret what happened there. And the question is, how do we deal with it? I don't think we we only deal. I mean, it's a long term perspective to empower the minorities so that at some point nobody even thinks about stepping on their necks. But uh, I think here we have a very immediate problem. How do we deal with that? How do we counter this? elementary racism that we have is it well if i go first i think i mean in a acute, acute i mean in an instant phase and we have the long term work and we have the short term and short term we need to make our our system work of course uh, people who murder other people should be held into custody and put in front of a judge uh, and we must make sure that our laws are equal. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the rule of law must be very, very strong. And if we can see by figures that it's not equal, that we don't live in an equal society, that, I mean, there is a reason why justice have a, a bl is blindfolded. It's because she shouldn't see uh, colors of the skin and so on. And I think that in, in the American system, what I know about this, this is a huge problem for them, that people are not equal. I mean, the rule of law doesn't uh, appeal to, to all of people living there. So that, I think, mm. is something that you can do in a short, short term. 
Mm. I mean, look at um, look at the European Parliament, for example, structurally. Um, where do we have? And uh, actually, Lior Smith is one of our uh, uh, friends who is watching us now. She's asking uh, this question: um, Have there been uh, any plans so far of uh, having and implementing a Black Caucus within the European Parliament? Um, was there something like, I mean, do we have enough people at all in the European Parliament who would be able to found a caucus? No. I don't see, oh, it was a question. No. Yes. Yeah, so well, the question was, the question is, uh, here. here is the question. Have there been any plans so far for implementing a Black Caucus within the European Parliament? Uh, I, my, the, my honest answer is, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so, but I don't know. Do you, and, and do you have something like that in Sweden, in, 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 in uh, parties? If we have a, a black... Uh, black caucus. What? Because, you know, it's like I, 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 a black group, black, black working group, uh, you yes. know, African European working group. I had uh, uh, once in a, in a local labor party founded, you know, a caucus of the Jewish members of the party. Yes, yes. So something like this. We have yes, in the parliament we have like we have a racism group. We work with races, but uh, mm -hmm. we are we are from different colors. And I don't know if there are any. I mean, I think I should have been approached and, or get to know if there was in the European Parliament. In the Swedish Parliament, there are none. But of course, there are informal networks of uh, people with color. But we are so few in the Swedish Parliament. And in the Swedish government, it was only me, so I was by myself. But <laughs> but. Uh, of course, there are networks, uh, and we we try to to support each other. I mean, Sweden is a very small society, and we know each other. People with power, people that are black and that have uh, positions in pol politics. So then we have a network, but I wouldn't call it a caucus. Mm. Uh, uh, Marvin, do you do you have any uh, experience on that? Because again, I think one of your the most powerful examples of of you as uh, personally. Is is an example of leadership, you know, leading by example, but also taking responsibility, um, as you know, in all the, the diverse facets that you represent. Um, do you work on something like that, kind of the empowering political inclusion within your party, for example? Yeah, there is. So first off, I would say I actually came in through to politics through an organization called Operation Black Vote that worked cross party um, and it, it started in the late 90s just getting black and Asian people to register to vote because people weren't registering to vote. Um, and then it transitioned into supporting people to get into positions of, you know, to become candidates. And there were a number of people, even in, if we were elected the Conservatives uh, and Labour particularly, that, that ended up getting um, getting their entry way into politics through Operation Blackburn because mm -hmm. the standing political parties were not good at recruiting people who weren't like them just like every other institution. Uh, within Labour, there is uh, something called BAME Labour. I don't really like the term, but it, it means black and minority ethnic. Um, there is, so there is a group within the UK Labour Party. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And I, I think there's probably something similar in um, the Lib Dems, Greens, the Conservatives in one form or another. But yeah, historically, yeah. the Labour Party has been the party that has been really kind of most receptive yeah. to black people. Um, in terms of uh, local government leadership, um, I think I'm one of two local government leaders in the, in the UK. Um, uh, and a, a guy called Joseph is a leader in London, a Lon of a London authority, but there's just two of us. And, I, and I'm, he tells Only me, two, wow. Yeah, he yeah. tells me that every day I'm, I'm leader in Bristol, I'm breaking a record as the longest serving ever black leader in the UK <laughs> local government. Uh, and, but the other interesting thing is, as I'm told, Sergey, and you can all correct me, I'm told I'm the first mayor of African heritage of any European city, a directly elected mayor. Wow. That's what I've been told. Uh, when wow. I met with the African American Mayors Association and I was introduced as such, they were absolutely blown away by that. <laughs> it was like, what? Incredible. Um, and I was at yeah. Euro Cities a few years ago. I looked around the hall, as I often do, uh, just to see if there's anyone like me. You know, we always do the check, you know. <laughs> and, I was, and there wasn't. It was just me. And I thought, well, of course it's just me. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the first one. <laughs> Wow. And, wow, and then Sadiq, Sadiq is the first Muslim mayor, you know, we'll see the mayor of London. Um, yeah, right. But that's actually quite, that's actually quite remarkable for, for, for Europe 
to be in that place. So, yeah. so Alice, in some sense, as you talk about European Parliament, probably same goes for leadership of European cities and, and European national governments, I, I suggest too. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, on your well, behalf, I think... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please, uh, Alice, you, you wanted yeah. to interview. Well, yes. but I think, uh, uh, who was it that asked the question? Uh, anyway, I think the person who asked this question, I think it, it's a good question. I mean, because uh, I need to identify what I can do uh, as Alice. I mean, of course, I can do uh, a lot when it comes to race awareness and now working, I'm the rapporteur of the uh, uh, Horizontal Anti-Discrimination uh, Directive and so on, and mm -hmm. I can do that. But maybe also I need to take uh, um, other steps, like uh, maybe building this forum and to try to foster black uh, politicians around the EU. So I, mm. I, I will uh, have a thought on this. On I, I can only I recommend... Be happy to talk, I'd be very happy yeah. to talk with you about that, Alice, because I, yes. I'd actually wanted to talk to uh, Euro cities um, and yeah. say, look, you know, is there something we can do similar to my experience with Operation Black Vote, where we can yes. begin reaching out to groups that are underrepresented um, in leadership? Wow. And actually, yeah, well, OBV great. started to reach out to Roma Gypsy um, in the UK yeah. as well. Uh, as well. Um, so it's it it to me, it's about underrepresentation. Um, Perfect. Uh, yeah. Race is yeah. one of those yeah. drivers. But again, again, I think our full power is there when we. We, we don't water down our position on racism, but we recognize its independence with other forms of oppression and begin to work, as you said, at that, you know, at that intersectionality. Yes. Exactly. But this is um, great. I will me... be in contact with you. you yes, you I will bring you... We talk now. Sergei's got I... my number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been harassing him for the past days to say, you know, don't forget about our program. Uh, uh, two, two questions that I see uh, that are interesting as well on the comments uh, side. One is uh, by uh, Tal Rekanati. Um, are there efforts to introduce racial literacy curriculums at schools in the UK and Sweden? Uh, so now we are in the education realm. Um, Racial rhetoric in school to are the efforts. Well, in Sweden, there have been a discussion for the last years uh, about uh, uh, on what we teach and what uh, about what the narrative is and what we are uh, teach or learn, mm -hmm. what, what children mm -hmm. learn in schools. So there have been a discussion. Uh, within the the collegium, I mean, it, it's not up in Sweden. We are very <laughs> sensitive when it comes from politicians telling teachers, professionals, on what they should learn to the children. So, but the teachers have had these kind of discussions on what they are really teaching, and and what are the children being learned about the, our Black history and about the Swedish colonial history that also exists that few knows about, and so on and so forth. So there has mm -hmm. been a discussion. Uh, but not like a big uh, political uh, decision-making movement, no. Uh, uh, Marvin, how does it look with, with you in the UK uh, in terms of curriculum on uh, uh, racial literacy at schools? Um, the racial curriculum or political, sorry? Um, it's uh, on literacy, racial literacy curriculum. I think it's, you know, it's about basically talking about what we're talking within yeah. the school curriculum. I think I, I, I think we've, we, we've moved on because there's been a whole uh, series of events, you know, following the murder of Stephen Lawrence in the McPherson report, talking about um, institutional racism, the Bradford riots, which, which launched the whole conversation around community cohesion. So there's certainly a heightened awareness um, of the need to talk about difference and how we live with difference. Um, how sophisticated that conversation is with children and young people, I don't know. Um, and how much of that conversation is actually shaped not by what goes on in school, but basically a globalization of culture that that does that does make you know identity more fluid. Um, um, that you know, I, I wouldn't sure how to uh, balance that mm. out. Um, mm, but I, I yeah. think you know, I, I'm certainly um, one that argues for um, the need for us to be race literate as a way of but you know becoming to the post-racial world I, I i think in some of those conversations the really immature conversation is let's just pretend there's no difference between us there's all one race the human race yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like Agreed. kind of th throw away the roadmap to how you got to my point is you know if you want to get post-racial you have to become phenomenally race literate in the short to medium term 
that is a yeah. reward for understanding the world and begin to dealing with those historical yeah. um, injustices. And, and, and I don't say that because I want to divide people. I am an embodiment, a physical embodiment of racial reconciliation. I want reconciliation, <laughs> um, but, it, but it, can't, it can't be done on the cheap. You know, and that's, that's the a very nice way, way of framing it. It's yeah, it's free, but, but it's not cheap, you know? No. But one of the most interesting discussions, uh, not, most, not most interesting, but one interesting discussion that we have had in Sweden during the last years is about the famous uh, author uh, Astrid Lindgren and her book about Pippi Longstocking, Pippi Longstrump yeah. in, in Swedish, because uh, the family of Astrid Lindgren, uh, her daughters who, who owns all her property and this world famous global selling book that uh, I mean produces millions and millions years of years, they wanted to change a sentence and uh, uh, names in the book because Astrid, when she wrote it, she called that Pippi's father was a, and now I will say the world, she, he was a Negro king. A Negro king. And when uh, during the last uh, 10, 15 years, Astrid Lingen's family uh, has wanted to change that word because they felt that Astrid wasn't a racist, they are saying, but this word, uh, word how to say a, a Negro king, uh, sounds uh, bad and has uh, bad uh, implications. So they wanted to change it. And of course they have the right to do it. They own the rights for Astrid Lindgren's books and her writings. But then the right-wing politicians and the right-wing party in Sweden, and among them a lot of racists, called, why are you changing our history? Astrid yeah. Lindgren wasn't a racist, and we yeah. don't want you to go in and change books she wrote in the 1950s or 1940s or whatever it was. Uh, so this has been a big, big discussion, and, and all of us who think that Astrid Lindgren's family has the right to do what they want, and they can argue for why they do it, because they don't want her books to be, uh, to to make children doesn't feel at home. And I know that when I read Pippi Longstocking, Being a Child, I my mother jumped that word. My white mother and my black father, uh, they jumped the word of Negro King. They just said that Pippi Longstock's father was a king in Africa somewhere. Wow. Uh, and, and, and this was, I mean, I'm old now. This was like 40 years ago. They jumped the world for me. And still, then we have people in Sweden, uh, mostly white people, arguing for that we need to have that Negro King word still in Asli Lingen's book, even though Asli Lingen's family wants to change it. And now they have changed it when they are pressing new books. But this, is, this has been a big discussion and it's often referred to when talking about identity politics and how the left and people like- Yeah, 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 we had, a similar, we had a similar uh, conversation in Germany as well. That's, that's one of those, it's, it's going round and round and round. Uh, let me, because we only have 10 minutes left, uh, uh, there are two uh, more. One comment by Hildegard Nichols. Uh, uh, welcome, Hildegard. Nice to see you. And uh, she is, you know, referring to our conversation regarding EU, US. And she, she says, I don't think police in the EU is as brutal as that in the United States. Uh, you know, that's like talking about um, do we see, what do we see in the mirror? Uh, right? Do we see the same situation? Is it a different situation? And I do think that, you know, one of the uh, uh, the tragic and, and actually criminal uh, um, combinations that we saw in this case is the racism, outmost structural and personal racism on the one hand, and on the other hand, the underst self-understanding of police, what they can do and what they cannot do, and what is their their goals and what are the instruments that they are allowed to use. Is it different in Europe? But, uh, well, the short answer is yes. I mean, <laughs> it's another context. You you can't just compare because we have a different uh, history and we have this different laws and so on and so forth. So of course there are many things, many indicators that differs. But racism is also of a nature that it takes different forms. And we know that racism exists in the EU and in, in Sweden and in the UK. So to fight racism and to fight police brutality, because that's also something that we have figures on and facts mm -hmm. around, that police brutality uh, are used and, and that it are used in, in 
the different much when it comes to different people and who was stopped by the police and being investigated and so on and so forth. So, I mean, we have racism uh, and even though uh, it is in another context than uh, the one in the US. Yeah, Marvin, I mean, you are as a mayor, you also have a police department. I think it's it's a city, I guess, in the UK, it's also a city prerogative. Do you, how do you see the parallels and the differences? in terms of police practices? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think there is something subtly different, you know, about the US. I wouldn't necessarily say there's something different about the nature of Americans as human beings. Um, <laughs> but it's something obviously around the culture and the structures around. So one of the things they've talked about in the US is having so many thousands of different police forces, each with their own cultures and their own structures, um, you know, and our, you know, I'm sure not every police force in the US is the same, has the same record of shooting innocent people or you know choking out um, innocent people to the point of death because they'll be led mm. differently you know i'll give you an example you know and, and the fact you know the guns that you know the prevalence of guns will be another dynamic as well um, right the us is that kind of you know wild west history you know live free or die and all those type of statements dirty harry you know it's um that you know they have they they you know they have this i mean you'd need a david berg to look at this group psychology of this whole thing wouldn't you um but i would give you an example of our policing in bristol i mean when the statue was pulled down in bristol over the weekend we had ten thousand protesters on the street they put ropes over the statue to pull it down and the police in bristol decided not to intervene um because it would have led to violent confrontation they felt um as a result the only criminal damage we had was the pulling down of the statue. No big smashed shop windows, no big brawl on the street. Intelligent, nuanced, ego-free, wise policing. De-escalating. No, no arrests, criminal damage, mm -hmm. a city that was still together afterwards and in a position where we can have a coherent conversation and when we build from here on. And I contrast yeah. that with what I've seen in some police states where they turn out uh, like the military, you know, um, you know, with with a population that look like they're they're in opposition to them, it's frightening. And as I said, Sergey, you, you know, not only the incident in New York, but I one late one night was driving with my wife and two children from Boston uh, to Philadelphia to visit my wife's grandfather, and we got pulled over by a police officer about eleven thirty at night in a service station. You know, everything about that interaction told me not to speak back. I'd normally speak up and make my mind yeah. felt about why he's pulling us over. I knew not to do it. And I wrote right. to the governor of New Jersey, I think it was Chris Christie at the time, and I just said, that would never have happened with a, with a, in a UK uh, uh, situation. Now, yeah. really, people have died in police custody in the UK, so I don't want to overplay this, right? Um, but there was something very sinister about that interaction that evening that kind of really kind of shook me up a little yeah. bit and made me quite proud of the way policing works, not every individual police officer, but that there is a structure that I can go to to try and get some justice. All right, it won't always right. work, but I feel it's going to be more responsive to me. Yeah. Let me bring the uh, two more voices to, into conversation. Ayub Hamidi uh, wrote, and he brings us back to the social questions, and he um, asks, um, uh, how do you see the existing poverty statistics in, in the EU a decade from now? Uh, so is EU Parliament, this is probably a question to Alice uh, and myself, but I'm, I'm just, a, <laughs> I'm not the, the guest. You're not uh, off the hook, Sergei. <laughs> yeah, I'm off the hook. Uh, is EU Parliament taking enough concrete steps to mitigate poverty? Um, uh, that's, a, I mean, uh, that's a huge question, a good question, Ayob. You know, because there are 100, before, before COVID-19 pandemic, we had 120 million people in the EU living on or under the poverty limit. 120 mm -hmm. million people. And I mean, the figures will be bigger now when we, when we will measure it again in some years due to the consequences of the uh, pandemic. So are we doing enough? No. We, we need to do more and we need to make sure that the politics now, all these big packages with, with billions and millions yeah. and billions, that they yeah. are really also uh, connected to who will suffer the, the hardest consequences. Uh, we need to do a lot more, a lot more. Mm. What we have seen mm. of Yellow West will be nothing compared to how people will go into the streets when they can't give their children food. All right. I 
I lost within the EU. But you, we cannot do this anymore. I mean, we can ask you the question, but this is this is so unfortunate. I'm sorry. I just need to say this: how how much we we regret and and uh, it's it's really beyond uh, comprehension what is happening now in terms of Brexit. And we wish so much uh, that it would be possible to join again uh, uh, under one umbrella of the European Union very soon. I will read. Just, can as, I just say, as two MEPs in front of me. Uh, one of the challenges that we want to take on as UK cities is how we as cities can broker our own relationships uh, with European cities, European countries and the EU itself, irrespective yes, of please. what our national governments uh, do. We have a massive aerospace industry, universities, um, you know, massive creative sector and uh, national government policy doesn't necessarily reflect what the cities in the UK actually need. Um, yeah. And we met Michel Barnier as uh, the 10 uh, UK core cities, the 10 biggest cities outside of London, Manchester, Liverpool. We went to meet Michel Barnier ourselves to talk about this. And, and obviously he's, you know, got his step diagram. He says, if your national government uh, negotiates this, this is what's available to you. But actually as yeah. MEPs, we'd love to have this conversation with you. We uh, are. You know, between so... us, we, can, we have 30% of, um, of, the, of the UK economy and over 20% of the population. Uh, and we want uh, those relationships because that's in our city's interests. Not necessarily Marvin, the policies of the national we government. We need to look beyond uh, the uh, d December 31st, and we need to find a way of mitigating those damages that the, the national government is doing on your side, I must say, because the EU is quite open on it. But let me finish with one <laughs> final question. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm a shadow, shadow rapporteur on UK uh, EU uh, agreement in the AFET in, or in the Paris Committee, so I'm like, yeah. Uh, let me finish with one final question, which I think is a great question to finish. And this is the, the question by uh, Axel Rodriguez. He's saying there is an organized racist movement that is spreading and cooperating uh, uh, among European uh, countries on the European level. What do you think would be successful for a European strategy of anti-racist movement to stop this development? One minute each uh, of our guests. What are the next steps that we should, pan-European steps, including UK, uh, 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 what do you wish that we should accomplish in the, say, one uh, upcoming year in order to uh, arrive to an anti-racist movement that will be able to counter the racism? <laughs> we need to organize ourselves and we need to organize ourselves uh, intersectionally and we need to mm -hmm. put our uh, our differences uh, on the side and really make sure that we focus on what we can build together that i would say oh. short thank you thank you what a wish uh hopefully it will be reality <laughs> uh marvin you so have know your enemy word. right know your enemy uh what is it that gives them access to lives, young lives, older lives, and be able to convince mm -hmm. them. I think poverty is a part of that. Um, and so we need to commit ourselves and, and hopelessness and loss of identity. So as a region, I think focusing on tackling poverty, uh, focusing on supporting people, uh, understanding who they are and identity is, um, is absolutely uh, essential. And in some sense, wow. drain the yeah. swamp. Yeah. Well, and, and let me add to that maybe uh, you know, we heard the labor message, maybe one more message. I think also addressing issues that we will be facing together and which could yeah. cause huge crisis in the future, also climate crisis, yeah. because we see now with COVID how easy it is to uh, make people insecure and to start, you know, give them an opportunity to, to look for you know, discriminating against something, looking for someone to uh, make uh, him or her guilty for everything. So let's so join again, forces. Yeah. We could be looking at 100 to 200 million climate driven migrants by the middle of the century. Mm. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So the two things are inseparable. Yeah. We, we, we think, I think that the social uh, welfare and uh, uh, also the green issues, the climate issues, but of course, and let's not forget, because this is important for me, it's not just about the holistic uh, issue, it's also about confronting racism and saying, looking to them into the eyes, not hiding away and not scaring away. And I know I'm not, I'm not a, a, an affected person, but me as a white person, looking into the eyes of a racist and saying, this is not okay. And you are not allowed to speak and to behave like that regarding other people. And I think this is the least 
we can demand and expect from from yes. other people especially the white people in our countries yes we so, need to be better in creating bad uh, bad uh, feelings uh, when we have dinner with a family and somebody says something racist we need making, to say that is racist yes making racists uncomfortable yes uh, it, out of comfort zone this this continent and this world is not your comfort zone this would be a huge step forward but of course fighting poverty and fighting all other crises. Thank you so much, uh, especially Marvin, if I may, Alice, yeah, especially yes, Marvin, because you, you know it's crazy where you are. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Uh, and thank you, Alice, as well, to, for dialing. Thank and you. I hope to see you next week, maybe in Brussels. Yes. I'm, I'm heading there to the plenary. And Marvin, we do hope to see you very soon with uh, maybe a new city, European city initiative across <laughs> the, the, uh, the let's Brexit. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about it. Um, we're, yeah, we're, we're a conversation. We need, we, we yeah. still want to keep trading. <laughs> Thank you so much. Stay strong. Thank you. And all the best. Great. And all the Bye -bye. best to everyone who watched us. We will reconvene at some point with new guests. Uh, thank you and have a nice evening.